and website, but also YouTube, Facebook, and on cable television on Roku. And you can see us on the big screen, so to speak. And we are all over the world with the internet and also broadcasting out of New Orleans on probably a hot, steamy day down there because it's hot and steamy in Austin, Texas, where I am, where South by Southwest music, film, and techno technology festival is happening all week long. And we are enjoying the pandemonium, at least for me, enjoying it by staying home. Um, I let everybody else do that type of stuff. And we are traveling to Miami, Florida with the lovely Krishna Rose, author of this wonderful book, Woman in Red, Magdalene Speaks. It is, wow, <laughs> it's a blast. Welcome to the show, Krishna Rose. Thank you so much, Bart. My pleasure to be here. Yes, and I am too. I've, I've been reading this book and it is, hmm, if I was going to describe one word with it or <laughs> no, one word that goes into 10 words would be, you have to read it slowly to really absorb its message. It is packed full of information. Mm -hmm. A wonderful balance of history, going into the mystic, into other worlds, and knowing what that's like. So we got a tremendous researcher, intellect, biblical scholar, my suspicion is, as well as a mystic going into other worlds, sharing what it be, would be like with Jesus and Mary Magdalene doing this type of work. Yes. Wow. So would you just start to show by just answering two questions at once or two questions together? I think they kind of go together. So I'll ask them together. Mm -hmm. What's your background that would, you know, give you the, information to write such a 500 page novel that is highly informative and highly imaginary and describing the way of life mm -hmm. and what inspired you to do such an epic book thank you great questions okay well uh, my background is i was born in england and raised in england uh, but I spent quite a lot of time in India as a child because my father is from Kashmir, India. So my Kashmiri roots led me to Jesus's tomb when I was eight years old in Srinagar, Kashmir, because my uncle was the head minister of Kashmir at the time and he took me there. And um, then fast forward when I was in my 20s living in India with my spiritual master Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj, um, I, my first question to him was, where is Jesus? Did he enter the kingdom of God when he died? Did he die on the cross? What happened to him? I, I had so many questions that I wanted answered because I had been to the tomb and I knew that he had died in India. So why were we being lied to about, you know, his life, his times, his teachings, his death? I noticed that there was some kind of missing piece of the puzzle and it bothered me from the age of eight years old until i was maybe 27 when i was sitting before the feet of my holy master who then revealed many secrets about jesus's life after the resurrection and before that i did not know and that people Ooh. do not know so i then spent 30 years really researching to back up everything that my guru dave had told me so i could back it up with history i wanted to piece together all of the missing puzzles of christ's life more so for myself than for anybody else i didn't realize i was going to you know turn it into this book it was just i i wanted to know what happened to him and then of course in kashmir i came across posters of Jesus and Mary Magdalene as a divine couple. Mm. Still, they still sell those posters even today. Wow. And just like how they have Sita and Ram and uh, Krishna and Radha, they have Jesus and Mary Magdalene 
<clears throat> so they were privy to some kind of information in northern India that the West was not privy to. So once I started realizing, oh, hang on a minute, there's a woman here that's been wronged in history. It resonated so much with my soul that I wanted to write her story from her perspective and right the wrongs that were done and said in their names. Mm. Uh, I felt like a great sense of injustice towards all of women um, because we all became prostitutes. We all became Eve's with her removal as the bride of Christ. Uh, she became the whore and so did we all. So we then, then we through the church, they then created a completely misogynistic um, male program, male dominated religion and removed everything female, including the goddess herself from yeah. worship. So I felt like Mary Magdalene's cause is very uh, pertinent for today's world because with her return to Christ's side, so too can we return the goddess to God's side. And with yes. that comes balance. And, and if we can have balance, then the world will be peaceful. Yes, as we go into those deep places of, it's almost like a shadow or a secret held back that the mystical mm -hmm. woman does not have a voice in this world that shouldn't be respected because mm -hmm. we forget Magdalene. We forget what she had to offer. Yes. Uh, it's interesting in the book, and it's really funny with the screen right now. One screen shows you a full face, but yeah. then on the other one, you're kind of cut off. Like I only oh. see from your nose down. That's so weird. It is really weird. Um, uh, if if any, oh, something. there you go. Perfect. Okay, I did it. I fixed it. Yep. Okay, yep. You just see. needed to back it up. Uh, now you right. now you come up front. Back up okay. a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All and right. if anybody out there uh, that wants to join in the chat and ask Krishna Rose question, please uh, mm -hmm. send them our way. And if anybody can give us feedback, who's watching on YouTube, Roku, UPRN website, if you let us know if you can see Krishna fully, because mm -hmm. uh, she is so lovely and she's got this great poster <laughs> behind her. So we don't want to miss that. Mm. Uh, so just let us know, please. Yeah, uh, it was that great book. And, and I love the perspective it, of that. Yes, this is a the, the voice of the mystic feminine. And mm -hmm. through this story, giving people perspectives, how to get there. Mm -hmm. And how do you tell that story? So much is through the actions of Jesus. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, you know, so many feminist books, that's probably a, not an, a politically correct, but it is on the feminine voice in the female's mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. And yet so much of the story is quotes of Jesus, which are beautiful. Yes. And uh, there's so many great quotes in this book but that tells the story of, yes. of what's going on. Yeah. You didn't exclude that trying to get Mary Magdalene's story out, mm. which is really wonderful. Yeah, I think her duty is to glorify her husband, you know, uh, because he was a very great man with great ideals and great ideas. And uh, in a world like we live in today, we need that more than ever. We need that that guidance of Christ, that Christ-like guidance to help us understand what we're really here for and what we're not here for. Yes. And of course, Magdalene being uh, the watch guard over the flock, her duty is to light that tower, really bright light and shine it so that all people will understand. If I do this, this is the consequence. This I'm going to smash myself on these rocks over here. And I felt such a burning need inside of me to, to, uh, to express these deep truths that were revealed to me um, 
to avert people from danger, from the danger in the afterlife. People don't know what they do. If they understood what they were doing to themselves in the future, they wouldn't do it. They might make different choices. So mm -hmm. I really wrote the book for that reason. Other than writing all of the wrongs, I wanted to be that light for people to say, this is not, you can't keep living this way. There's going to be a consequence. Well, I got to ask you a question in response mm -hmm. to that. But first, mm -hmm. I want to say that Martha Morell, thank you, Martha. Hope you're enjoying up there in McKinney, Texas. She says mm. that she can see you fine. Thank you, Yay. Martha. Thank you. And uh, you, you said, so we'll know how to protect ourselves in the mm. afterlife. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, you know, the workings of karma, an eye for an eye, mm -hmm. is it's, it's actually very simple, but people complicate it. If we really look that everything that we say and everything that we do has an, has an equal and opposite reaction, like a boomerang that goes out into the collective and then comes back and hits you. So it's either going to hit you with all of these blessings and good deeds that you've done in the world, all of these wonderful things that you've put out into the world, or if you've been a cheater, if you've been a thief, if you've been a rapist, if you've uh, murdered people, you know, all of these things that people do in quiet with behind closed doors where they think no one is watching, someone is watching. <laughs> and so that's the point. The point of the book is, is that there's nothing that is not recorded. Every inch of our lives is being watched and recorded so that when we leave this flesh, we will from there be taken to the next place of um, that we have created for ourselves. So, you know, if you've been, uh, you know, generally like a good person and you haven't done anything bad, then, you know, you're going to have a, a more positive experience than someone who is doing bad things behind closed doors, thinking that they're going to get away with it. Yes. And that's also the internal world is just as, we were chatting. Yeah. I was yeah. kind of bragging like, yes, I'm going to France next week. Lucky Start my you. tour business. And and I have two lives in France and America. I'm just kind of bragging mm -hmm. and stuff. And Kristen responded to me, goes, I have an inner life and an outer life where I'm traveling all the time. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. Which is so much about what the book is about. Uh, yes. And, and we think uh, Danielle... Uh, MacArthur, Hare Krishna, beautiful soul. Hello. Uh, yes, thank you, Daniela. Hare and uh, Contemplative Rose Channel, uh, Wonder. Thank you Hello. for joining in. Blessings. Yeah, it's it's that inner and outer world that you explain so well mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. And we get it that Jesus is a master of it. Yes. And Mary Magdalene is... You're really explaining that journey that she's taking. Yes. And exactly what you're saying on the other side, she is a kind and generous, loving woman. Yes. She cares more for the flock than just about anybody. You know, she's like Mother Hen. I see, I see Mary Magdalene as like the mother of, mother of all living beings. She's so concerned for everybody's welfare. And... Um, and the reason that she is carrying this weight is because she is returning the goddess, she's returning the feminine divine. And so she is, um, she is the healer. She is the mother that is not just guiding everyone from unfortunate situations in the afterlife, but she's the inspiration. She's the she's the guidance. She's the protector. She is the wife and bride of Christ. And there's so many prophecies that, you know, when the world can accept her at the left side of her husband, that if we can heal the wound, Christ's manly wound. Um, because, you know, when the church said that he was never married, actually, the Bible says nothing about his marriage. It was never mentioned if he was married or not married. And there's a reason for that, because 2000 years ago, 
a rabbi born of Davidic blood, who was a prince one day to be a king, the number one order of the day is to have progeny, is to have heirs to your throne, especially as a Jewish man. So it would have been just expected that he would have been married. And there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, Jesus was in a scene and they didn't believe, you know, they believe in celibacy. The Essenes were, cert were a certain group, but Jesus was not affiliated with that group mm -hmm. of Essenes. I don't care what anybody says, he's not. And there's, there's, there's evidence for this. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is, is how he treated the women, how he treated Mary Magdalene, because the Essenes are a brotherhood. There is no real sisterhood, it's a brotherhood. And so Christ was actually connected with the Therapeutae through his mother, Mary, and they lived in Sketis in the mountains of Alexandria, Egypt. And um, they were vegetarians. They lived very similarly to the Essene Jewish brothers, but they had a sisterhood where the women were treated equally. They were revered. They were respected as teachers and healers. And... Um, there was no misogyny. They were just all seen as equals. And so the therapeutic, in my opinion, it just seems like the obvious place that they would have fled to because uh, it was up high in the mountains. It was very remote. Mm -hmm. Nobody would go there. And the influences of masculine and feminine divine and this very peaceful way of living that he had, um, it, it, a lot of it came from the therapeutic. If you, I actually went quite deep into how the therapeutic used to run their communities and the, the laws by which they lived, the way that they lived with nature and with the seasons and with one another and with the seasons of life. It was so beautiful to me. It was actually the most profoundly beautiful community way of life that I've read of anywhere in the world. Wow. Because it was so perfectly run and I really got to describe their daily life in the book. And I was really happy that I got to do that because um, it's an ideal way of living. And, uh, you know, given that we're now living in a pretty un unideal situation, I figured it would be a great addition uh, to the book so that people could understand, wow, I could live like this if I wanted to. And that's what's one of the beauties of the book is, is you describe so many ways of life mm -hmm. uh, and the terrain and people and their food, their, yeah, just their style of living. Mm -hmm. This kind of puts it in kind of an epic category mm -hmm. uh, because that's what the great epics do is they describe mm -hmm. a way of life in a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you go into this journey with this, uh, whether that be uh, in Israel <coughs> or uh Egypt or France or yeah. Middle East, mm -hmm. you know, you, you you get this wonderful tour along mm -hmm. with this story. Yes. Uh, so, so it's so wonderful with that. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to something you said earlier, mm -hmm. um, that maybe one of the reasons they were secret, I just want to see what your spin is about mm -hmm. the offspring is that they were afraid the Romans would hunt them down and, and kill them because they did not want the next generation Messiah coming back to um, Jerusalem and starting another riot. Yes, absolutely. I mean, when they, when they fled, the only, fam the only family members who remained in, in Judea was James, the eldest brother of Jesus, who was younger to him. And he went on to continue the mission long after they'd left. Yes. And he became a huge personality in Jerusalem. And he ended up also being martyred. He was, he was murdered and stoned to death on the, on the stones of the temple. So um, then you have, you know, uh, Cleophas. And Cleophas was Mother Mary's third husband. He was the brother of Joseph. So... Uh, the rest of the family, you know, they all went, they tried, they went on all of these amazing adventures around the world because as Messiah, his, ful his fulfillment of prophecy was everything because without it, 
the message wouldn't have spanned the last 2000 years. So he knew he would have to go through crucifixion. He knew that he would have to rise. He knew that he would then have to go and search out the lost tribes of Judea and preach to them. So he had a whole mission after the resurrection yes. that, you know, people, they say, oh yeah, he only had, you know, seven years or three years ministry or whatever. No, people have no idea about the full length of this man's life. And, you know, people say, well, that, oh, I, I've had people say, well, that wasn't in the Bible. You, you wrote this thing, but that wasn't in the Bible. And I say, well, the Bible describes about 16 weeks of a man's life. From the, from the perspective of the apostles who never really got to see Jesus afterwards. No. And these, yeah, these people who were writing these gospels, they weren't present. They never met him. Yeah. They never met him. Any of these people that wrote these gospels. So you have to then go to the older texts that haven't been indoctrinated, that haven't been uh, mistranslated for propaganda's sake. And so you read uh, books from uh, the Essene, like the Essene Gospel of Peace by St. John, for example. It's a book of four or five books, I believe, that most people haven't ever read. Now, I've these never heard books, of that. yes, they're the most incredible books. So these books are the unadulterated teachings of Christ um, as never before heard. And that is the Jesus that I know and love. Like when I read wow. the Essene Gospels of Peace by St. John, I knew this was the teacher. This was the master that I remember and love. And these are the teachings that I want to present to the world again, because they really got lost. Okay. So many of the teachings that are inside of the book were from that, from those more esoteric texts. Say it again. So people who are writing this down will have yes. time to write it down. Yes, the Essene Gospel of Peace by St. John. It's a series of four small books, and I can't recommend these books enough. They, cha they changed my life in as much as Bhagavad Gita changed my life. How did you find those? Ah, uh, well, you know, once you start going down the rabbit hole of anything, you start learning about other types of texts. So in India, there's this one um, place called Hemis. It's a monastery up in the mountains of Ladakh in a uh, very northern tip of Kashmir. And Christ was called to come there after resurrection because the Buddhists in that region believed that the risen Christ was their reincarnated Dalai Lama. Wow. Yes. So when he went to Hemis, they healed his feet. They were bathing his feet and anointing his feet and wrapping, wrapping his feet daily because um, he would ooze pus and blood yeah, from, so, from the wounds in his feet. They never really healed it for the rest of your, his life. Yeah, that was that was a real curiosity about me. I just wondered if that was almost yeah. like a huge symbolic uh mm -hmm. reminder for him mm -hmm. that he would never totally recover from this wor wound he never did I, I never want to i don't want to tell you too much about the book but <laughs> he struggled with this like this is the, all, the 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 spikes that went through his feet and his hands they never mm -hmm. fully healed and yeah. they kept oozing pus which this is like I wonder if that pus was just absorbing the pain of everybody around him and because he was amongst it, he did not shy away mm -hmm. from being right in the middle of the conflict. In oh, fact, not at all. Yeah. He went he right it. into it. <laughs> yeah, he loved it. <laughs> and he so, was a rebel. A rebel yeah, with yeah. A call, with a cause. And therefore, you know, it was like that was just another way he was expulsing it. I mean, mm. he was, had this as you talk about in your book, this tremendous love, mm -hmm. and you would equate this to faith. In other words, it's one thing to say, yes, I have love and I feel vibration of love and I feel light and it's all in me and it's there all the time. Right, right. However, the real test is when you are in that presence of people that are lost or they're evil and yeah. you're still bringing that out Mm -hmm. Yes. Which, 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 you know, you could say it's fearlessness, but it's also faith. 
and your it's story, grace. So, yes, grace. it's grace. And in the story about Saul mm. becoming Paul, yes, I was love a that. great example about that yes. that you have in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody says, "Don't, don't tell him who you are. He's yeah. going to kill you. He's yes. a Roman." <laughs> Yes. Well, you no. know, the Romans, they, they were definitely terrified of the progeny of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. But the, the real reason was they, like, like with all religions and politicians and kings and popes, they all want the, uh, the control and the power. So when they took Christ's message and cre decided to create a religion out of it, uh, which I don't think was ever his intention, Jesus' intention at all. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they ran with it, and then they realized, oh, there's these children that they didn't really know about because there, weren't, there was no internet or cell phones, so how would anybody have known where did Jesus go after the resurrection? It was just rumors, um, unless yeah. they were actually saw him or were there. So the people who did actually document where they were, and where they went, I was able to follow the breadcrumbs and put it all together for this story. But the Romans, they were scared. It, it, the Roman church was afraid of the progeny because the messianic lineage is a king line. It's, it's a lineage that gives them power over all thrones above all else mm. because it's it's a divine throne it's not of this world it's not like the windsors who have a, a fake crown on their heads it's a uh, this is by divine right that they are the ones to rule and so their family the children um yes i think there was a lot of fear you know nobody wanted they, they didn't want to be found for a period of time. And so they preached quietly. They went about their service to humanity quietly, incognito, to fulfill all of the messianic requirements um, that would befit their station. But their work is, uh, it's, it, it's a miraculous thing that it survived 2000 years, honestly. It's a miracle. So whenever anybody asks me well, you know, we don't, I don't believe he was the Messiah. Like a Jewish person say, might say to me, well, I don't believe in that Messiah. I still think my Messiah is coming. And I say, who's the most famous man in history? <laughs> who's the most famous Jew in history? You, no one can refute this. It's 2000 years this man has ruled the hearts of millions of people around the world and given them faith and inspiration. Yes. And he happened to be a Jewish Messiah and King. So anyway, it's all very there, interesting. Isn't there it? you have it. And regardless of how the teachings of Jesus have been butchered and, you know, misinterpreted, mm. it's always amazing how many people have evolved to a higher self mm. through that personal practice. Yes. And it's, it's beyond, it's beyond religion. It's yeah. purpose, practice, and love always mm. connects these things. And before yes. we go any farther, Mm. I want to tell everybody that you are visiting with Krishna Rose and you can find her information and buy her wonderful book, Woman in Red, Magdalene Speaks. It has such a juicy cover. I have to say this woman, she's very exotic on the cover. Uh, and then there's <laughs> a fox and a butterfly, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm real curious about all the symbolism of that. However, yeah. You can get this at KrishnaRose.com, uh, mm -hmm. also on other bookstores and stuff. It's all over the place. Well mm -hmm. worth uh, your time and money. Thank you. And you are on Becoming Quantum Conscious. And my name is Bart Sharp. And we are at the United Public Radio Network and UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 107.7 and 105.3, being seen on Roku, cable television, the UPRN website, Facebook, YouTube, Spreaker, and other internet platforms all around the world. So this is an exciting time to talk about such an exciting subject mm -hmm. with that, uh, that Christ and Mary Magdalene had this impression. And I just want to go into the future. I'm, I, I have all my questions, but uh, this is a very spontaneous question. Mm. How do you think people are evolving mm. with 
the Mary Magdalene consciousness these days? Well, it's very interesting. It's very multifaceted. I think with, with their return, many people are being currently activated in this Magdalene phenomena. And there are many people who right now on earth believe that they are the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene or Jesus. And I've had many people approach me claiming that they are these personalities. So as, as it, I don't want to judge anybody for what they're feeling. I, I've heard to say, say, say the most, uh, mm -hmm. same, same thing with me. Yes, and and also I wanted to say yes. that we have, uh, Michelle Delrochet, uh, who is on the outer beyond. She is the outer beyond. Nice. Uh, and, um, with paranormal Canada's nice. Canada's most haunted, uh, she's nice. with us today and Love she's it. one of my heroes or heroines, hmm. a, a total badass, as I had to say. Oh, bless it in be. General. Love it. Oh yeah. Michelle <laughs> is amazing. And her show is on Wednesday and Thursday nights on nice. UPRN well, and I am Michelle. interrupting. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. And, um, as you were saying, I'm sorry so to interrupt you. I, I, yes. So what, where were we? What was the question? We were talking about Mary Magdalene today and her presence with the world oh, yeah. and people mm. reincarnating or mm. that the yeah. Magdalene line is within them or the mm. Jesus line. Mm. I've yes. I've heard this too from, all kinds countless, of people. countless people. Yeah. So I think I think it's a phenomenon, and it's not something we could just brush aside and say it's mental health issue. I think that it's a far deeper phenomenon. So I've really meditated on this because I've had so many people approach me claiming to be these people. So I personally believe that they are here, Magdalene and Jesus. I think they're both here, reincarnated in the flesh, and I think that their activation in the collective is what's making so many people believe that they are these personalities in history because they're coming back into the flesh and, and reconnecting with this collective energy on earth and bringing that messianic message into this time period we're now in. It's so crucial, it's biblical, it's, it's prophecy. And so lots of people are feeling this energy and they're not knowing what it is, so they're just thinking, it's got to be me. It's got to be because I am this person. Um, but really, it's just because they are here and they are meditating and praying for our world. And um, it's activating all of us in this consciousness. Yeah. So that's what I think. And if you are one of these people uh, that has this connection, um, mm. I've heard a lot of various theories. All I can say is mm. maybe true. But what's mm. important is how much can you embody mm. that vibration that your potential has inside of you? Yes. It's an inside job, folks. Mm. Yes, and that's is. such a beauty of this book because you're telling the story of this internal astral world that, mm. that through Mary Magdalene of her journeys, mm -hmm. and yet, Jesus has already gone to these places yes. and is a master of it. Yes. And so you get both sides of this journey in mm -hmm. this story of, uh, and I don't want to say that Mary Magdalene is the underling. She's mm. just, um, she's the apprentice in right. She's the rising uh, apprentice. <laughs> maybe, or maybe she's just an equal and she's just not on the same uh, timeline. Uh, 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 uh. Yes, that's yeah. correct. You hit the nail on the head, Bart. Well said. So that's exactly my belief is that she was like the apprentice living with the master who taught her how to become master herself. Yes. And that is the truth for all of us. Yes. Because, you know, Jesus doesn't want just, or Magdalene, you know, they don't want just that they are the ones being worshipped and we're all down here somewhere. They're uh -huh. asking all of us to come up to their level because if we can come up to their level and and it's not impossible nobody can tell me that the amount of divinity that is in christ is not in me or is not in you it's the same amount of divinity we were all created equal at the time of creation 
when we stand before our creators, we are all equal. There is not one of us who is set above one another. And Christ yes. did not come to be revered as the, you know, the, I think it's sort of, it's gone against what he actually came to give, what he actually preached, you know, because I think he was very humble, uh, generous with his spirit and his words and his healing and everything because he wanted nothing for himself. He just wanted to serve the environment and, and lift everyone up. And so much in the book, you know, you, you, you had these chapters where you're basically given a dialogue that, of Jesus speaking to the crowd. Yeah, uh, I think the favorite one is that after he was off the cross, mm -hmm. he spent a couple of years healing, and he was in France. Ga Gallia's in France. Am I? Am yes. I? Okay, gotcha. Uh, pro probably where I live, and in that area, <laughs> yep. or maybe on yep. the coast. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you know, he's kind of incognito, but everybody's kind of wondering. And then one day he, it's almost like, I can't stand it. I got to yes, speak. <laughs> that's it. That's exactly right. It just resonated so much with me when I wrote that because I, yeah. I could just imagine seeing him sitting over there sulking and meditating and brewing. Like my life is meaningless at this point. You know, I have yeah. to go out and preach. So Exactly. He's a messenger yes. with wings. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and if you are a messenger with wings, by God, you got to find some way to get the message yeah. out. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah. And so you have these great dialogues of mm -hmm. just what that is. And so much of it is mm -hmm. in a simple phrase is get to work. Yes. It's not a lazy path. You see Christianity. Uh, in fact, I'd say many religions, they, they've, they've been set up now where we are in our modern age as more of a, like a club that we're a part of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily like an actual point of, okay, now I have to go inside and do what Jesus told me to do with my life. They're more of this framework of like, Oh, he died <coughs> for me. He saved my sins by dying on the cross. But, but who, who made that up? Who said that that's what happened? Because that's not what happened. What happened was, yeah, I never got that. Sanhedrin, they wanted him dead because he was speaking out against false gurus. They wanted him dead because he was a threat because he was the Messiah and he was there to unite the people of Judea and Rome. And, um, you know, they didn't like it. It was too, too agitating for the Sanhedrin because they wanted the power and the glory. So that was really the main reason. But of course, deeper than that on esoteric levels, it was because he knew he had to go through this it was a part of his life purpose that if he could survive this crucifixion and actually do the impossible and come back to life from death from death and then go on to preach how how much greater is his message after the resurrection this is this wow. is what people don't think about well but, well mm -hmm. said and and just to apply that to everybody's normal life how can mm -hmm. your faith in your own internal love in this vibration that you're growing and percolating inside of you can mm. take you and help you actualize dreams that you have mm. that you bring out just like all the love that you have in mm. this book and mm. writing it and now promoting it and just mm. being that message. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like, some of those same spiritual journeys. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a very beautiful thing. Bringing, bringing what they came to give 2000 years ago into the present is really what I tried to do. I wanted to give people an experience where they could, even though they're living in this modern age, they would totally relate to Mary Magdalene through her struggles and her, her weaknesses and her frailties and her strengths and, all of the hardships that that woman went through as a wife, as a woman, as a mother, as a teacher, and eventually as a saint. And, but what I find so intriguing was that I, when I was writing the book, I intuited that she's the feminine Christ. And I added that in the book 
with no I'd never heard that from anybody else ever before that that she was that she was to be the finale of the messianic mission but that was the message that Christ kept giving me to write into the book he wanted me to express that that yeah I laid the groundwork for for Mary Magdalene's work to fulfill my mission so so I want to ask you a daring question yeah do you think that mary magdalene and her teachings were the seeds of what generated the culture of the Qatars? oh definitely yeah definitely i think uh, i think the whole family i'm just going to put these on so i can see everybody more see you more clearly here um i think well the whole family of course they were based in france other than christ who died in india they all remained in south of france because there was um a very large community of jewish settlers who had come who had fled judea and gone to france so of course it would be natural that mary magdalene and jesus would go there to recover after this horrible experience that they went through because they already had friends that were living in that region and there were already jewish communities and a scene community set up and um, they wanted to build a new Jerusalem out of Jerusalem. So my understanding was that Mary Magdalene and, um, and the people that were around her and Christ, they, they built tunnels underneath, you know, Carcassonne area, Rennes le Chateau especially, all of this tunnel system where they buried the sacred treasures that were brought out of Jerusalem mm. with with the Christ family. Yes. Um, there were many treasures brought out of Judea by the family to southern France and buried in those underground caverns, which were then held um, and protected by the Knights Templar, who were who were either protecting the bloodline family, the descendants, or um, were themselves bloodline family descendants. So they were the Cathars. The Cathars were the group of people in France who knew of Magdalene and Jesus's marriage and their progeny. And who, they practiced so many of those values that were not remembered by the church, like men and women were equal. No. Men and women both wrote and write, which did not happen yeah. uh, in the Dark Ages. No, uh, they, correct. They were exceptional. Mm -hmm. And it really brings you up to the question is just like, well, why would they bury this stuff down? I mean, mm -hmm. there's one saying, oh, we want to keep it secret, but mm. also it's a vibrational presence. It's yes, a magnifier. It is a, well, I think that the reason why it was kept secret and held in such close um, guarded ways for the last 2000 years is so that we can live right now at the time that we're in right now with all of this light flooding into the planet because even mm -hmm. though it was kept hidden the fact that it it, it is still here 2000 years ago and that their message did not die with their bodies that it's still we know about these truths 2000 years it astounds me because yes. the church and the propaganda wheel of the media and all of his extensions around the world for 2000 years did everything they could to stamp out Mary Magdalene's glory, to stamp out her name, yes. to stamp out her, her, her truth, her wisdom and her womb, the power of her ability to birth this king's children, which means that we have true heirs and true kings walking on earth today who have been protected for 2000 years and yes. they have that divine right to rule. Whereas, you know, we have some rulers that are not, they don't have that right to rule. So perhaps we're going to see some shifts happen. And yes. that's what and I'm I, hoping. And, and beyond bloodlines and stories and sacred mm -hmm. texts and all of this stuff, mm -hmm. the, one of the important ingredients of how things are remembered is through vibrations. Yes. And the vibrations stimulate our mind, mm -hmm. our heart and our body to have certain levels of awareness. Therefore, we're attracted mm -hmm. to that form of evolution. And mm -hmm. when we think of a place like Renly Chateau, that's yes. exactly what it does. It vibrates yes. it out like a big beacon. So it naturally, really does. It really does. You would bury the stuff down there. 
Well, what really blew my mind about the historical text was I came across many, you know, people believe that, you know, some Maxime area, for example, in, in France is the area that, you know, the family first arrived. So we know that was the actual area that they arrived on the boat from Alexandria. And we know that there were 77 people on the plane, on the, on the, on the plane, on the boat. 77? 77 people arrived okay. with them. Um, all of their family members, their closest, nearest and dearest and followers. And, wow. um, but they didn't remain in that area. They then moved in, inland toward their, towards Provence, where they were more close into the countryside. But eventually Magdalene ended up in Rennes-le-Chateau, for sure. And mm. this, this Rennes-le-Chateau, this hill, is a, this blew my mind, because it, it ties my faith to, to everything that I'm talking about, is that this place was called Rade Hill. Then the chateau used to be called Rad A Hill. And Rad A is the name for the goddess. Wow. That's the name for the feminine divine living within the kingdom of God. So when wow. I saw this, I was like, it makes perfect sense that Magdalene would have gone to Rad A Hill and that they would have built the, the, the inner chambers there. And when I came to Ren le Chateau, oh my goodness. I mean, I, I, I love churches and cathedrals, but when I came to Rennes le Chateau, I have to say that it was the sweetest church I've ever sat in in my life. Mm -hmm. the, the, there was a, <coughs> there's like an energy, a frequency that is palpable in the air, like a thick, sweet, devotional purity in the air that I don't sense in any other church other than this place. So when I first came there, I knew I was like hundred percent. She's she is buried here. Hundred percent, her body is here. <laughs> yeah. And so it, then, mm. it, it and it has so many different peaks that are connected with that. A yes. And um, this is one little tidbit. There's all of these little sacred pentangles and sacred triangles yeah. of different power spots. But yes. one of my favorite little facts with that is there's a huge triangle where. Uh, Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. the Bomberg Islands in Denmark and Rennes mm. Chateau are connected. Wow. Bomberg are the grounding force. Mount Sinai is probably the most powerful energies on the planet. It's very mm. special. Yes. And Rennes Chateau is the beacon point. That well, again, that out. the beacon, you've got, the, you've got that beacon, the Magdalene light, the tower, the watchtower. That's, oh, yes. I, I, I love that you just said that, that the, yes. the beacon of light comes from Mary Magdalene and her hidden, the, tre the hidden treasure of what she is and what, what she represents in today's world. Because, yes. you know, even, even if nobody wants to accept her, let's say as, as the Messiah, as a Messiah or as a messianic figure, or even as the wife of Christ, if we can just accept her, her call, to prayer her call to a prayer life a prayerful life a contemplative life it's just so necessary in today's world because we're so busy we're so much more distracted and so much busier than we've all ever been in life we have more distractions from every second of the day than no. ever in history yes so and it's, how it's do so we, speeded up it's so speeded up so then how do we as spiritual beings, not just cope, but thrive in an environment that is so hostile to our joy. Well, I, I like to think that our DNA has expanded and speeded up along with it. And it gives us an opportunity mm. to just build a different definition and impetus. But this ancient, it's almost like we can't go backwards but we can mm -hmm. take the old information, the old vibrations and have a new mm -hmm. application. Yes. Uh, it doesn't matter what age we're in. If we close no. our eyes, if we close our eyes and go within and we start pray and we pray and we meditate and we really strive to have realization of God that, you know, when you begin your prayerful practice that you say, I'm not going to stop praying till I have a vision of you, Lord. 
I'm just yes, going to keep yes. doing this until you reveal yourself to me. Eventually, it, yes. you're going to have a cosmic realization of the Lord or of the lady. You're going to. It's yes. inevitable because that grace is naturally given to that soul who seeks. Like he said, seek and ye shall find. But if there's no seeking, there's no finding. So how do you seek? There has to be a methodology. And so that's very missing from today's yes. Christianity, if you like. It's just like, oh, well, if I go to church or if I take Holy Communion, I'm saved. It's not that simple. It's, it's no. a, it's, there's a very large missing component because and what, Christ and, and taught what people it, to meditate. And he what is to saved? <laughs> and what is saved? I mean... It's yes, not, it's exactly. not, you know, it's, it's much, much more than that. It's much deeper. It's more internal. Uh, yes. And we're coming, we're coming to the end of the hour. And all I can say is, dang, I did not get to ask some of my favorite Aww. questions. Aww. And you'll have to, I, it, it's like, just for people out there, they're thinking about buying this book. Mm. All I can Give, I'm just going to put some juicy excerpts for you to say. Uh, and then I'm going to give my ending credits. Okay. And you're going to end the show by just giving us about a one to two minute message of a message that you would like to give all the listeners today, whatever okay. that is. Yeah. Uh, there's so much stuff of the relationship of how G uh, Yeshua summons Lazarus. The description mm -hmm. of Peter and yeah. my most oh. favorite concept of the book that just drop, dropped my jaw big time mm -hmm. was the parallel of Mother Mary and yes. Isis. Yes. Oh, I wish I would have got to ask you that question. Oh. However, maybe another <laughs> time yes. we'll get to talk about that. And we'd love that. And, um, you know, you just give so many little stimulating tidbits yeah so this is a great book woman in red magdalene speaks by krishna rose and you can uh find out more about krishna rose by going to her website www.krishnarose.com you can go to facebook and go to magdalene speaks holy grail journeys is that right Ex Holy Grail Experience, yes. Holy Grail Experience. Magdalene Speaks Holy Grail Experience and, and become a part of that group. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are at Becoming Quantum Conscious. My name is Bart Sharp. And next week, we will be exploring the um, ancient beginnings of, of uh, Tai Chi. Ooh, in fun. Yes, uh, with Alex Stokes. And so this will be really fun. He's a local Austinite. And uh, you are on United Public Radio Network and UFO Paranormal Radio Network, 107.7 and 105.3, broadcasting out of New Orleans, Louisiana. And you can find this recording on YouTube. Uh, uh, and uh, you can find uh, other recordings on the UPRN website. And you can find it on Roku on cable television. So, you know, you can send this to your friends or just watch it again mm -hmm. or connected to it. So Krishna Rose, uh, mm -hmm. what final words of wisdom do you have for everybody? I would say, you know, at the end of everything that I've journeyed with, my conclusion is that God's holy names has the power to cure and heal and dissolve all of our woes, as well as realize ourselves within their eternal kingdom, which is within our hearts. So inside is the temple, close your eyes to the outside world, take holy name, dive deep inside your heart with this yearning mood of please lord i will not stop praying until i have vision of you and then day your vision and when you have that vision you will be astounded and when you are astounded you will know love and from that point on you'll be on your path exactly where you have to go so my final word on all things 
is take to the practice of chanting God's holy name in whatever language, whatever tongue, whatever names resonates truth for you. Because my, my prayerful life has brought me to my knees in devotion due to the power of God's holy name and how it has transformed me, transformed my consciousness and transformed the collective energy because everything we speak and everything that we say and sing affects the world in the frequency space because we're all connected with this energy of the earth. So everything that we speak is going around the earth seven times. Mm. So when we speak holy name, sing holy name, chant holy name, when we say God's holy name out loud, that, vi that vibration of purity and power and divine love and sweetness that is there in the name reverberates around the world, healing, and helping our environment rather than harming it. So that's my advice is please everyone take to a practice of some form of meditation and chanting and go deep inside until you find the treasures and don't give up. Keep searching till you find. If you don't find, keep going. Don't give up. Wow. Because the, tr the treasures are there. I know I've seen them. I've experienced it. The treasures are there to be found. So please, don't give up your faith, but it's not as easy as I just go to church and I believe in Jesus, so I'm saved. It, that's not how it works. The work has to be done. It is a self-realization process. So self, soul self, eternal self that is undying. But who is that? Who are you when you are standing before God face to face? Because that's who you really are. And everything else is not who you really are. So it's like a, a, a falling away of the false ego and, and a growing into your true identity. Beautiful. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much, Krishna Rose, Very author welcome. of Woman in Red Magdalene Speaks. Uh, wow. This is a Thank rich hour. Thank you so hour. much for inviting me on your show, Bart. It's been such a pleasure. I hope we do this again. Oh, me too. We have lots and to talk about. <laughs> indeed. I got an ISIS question for you already. Yes. yes. All right. Well, we'll see y'all all next week. And thank you so much, Krishna, for being on the show. Many blessings. God bless you all. God bless you all. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. It all depends on which veil, how you're looking at the world around you. And until you feel safe, you can't open your heart to other people. And you only feel safe when you've cultivated that part of yourself which is not vulnerable, which isn't just your separateness. As long as you think you are only your separateness, you are doomed to fear and anxiety all the time. If only the fear of death. Welcome, everyone, to another Ramdas Here and Now episode. This is number 246, How to Be Responsive, Not Reactive. And don't we all need that from time to time, especially in these times where everything seems really inflammatory? Um, if you don't know me, I'm Jackie Dobrinska, the host, and you all are this incredible Ramdas community from around the world. Thank you for tuning in. This episode is a continuation of the last one, which was a lecture in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1987. Maybe you think of Ram Dass and his awakening originally through the psychedelic experiences that sort of opened him to these other planes of himself. But in this episode, he gives example after example of these everyday experiences well, uh, not quite everyday experiences, but they're the relationships that helped him wake up in a similar way, you know, to wake up to those places beyond our roles and those habituated beliefs and thought forms and forms and into this other part of ourself that is expanded and present and in communion with what is that sort of 
intuitive heart, that place that the Sufi and Christian mystics wrote poems about, and that place that I think most of us long for in a deep way. 